Has, does anybody here, uh, uh, you know someone who has been lied on, shamed, sabotaged, rejected, neglected, infected, left junkyard dog dirty wrong? Does anybody know somebody like that? Man, it's amazing that you not only didn't identify yourself, but you didn't know anybody else that's ever been done wrong by somebody else. That's amazing. I'm going to ask again, does anybody know anybody that's been done wrong, lied on, misaligned, shamed, rejected, neglected, infected? Yeah, yeah. If you don't know anybody like that, how about you? Okay, and if not, have some sympathy for me because I get it night and day for years now. Amen. All right, we want to talk about believing for vindication. In case you don't know what vindication is, that's when God turns around and he uses people you don't even know to reinstate you, clean up your name. You know, understand that? Now, the problem is when somebody rejects you, shames you, lies on you, tries to seek your destruction or whatever it is, it's your emotional reaction to that that you have to watch out for. You have, a, have you ever been at a traffic light and you're waiting, waiting, and then uh, it turns green and the person behind you, because you were looking on your phone, leans on the horn and then walks by and does a hand gesture of how many children they wish they would have had. Do you, do, 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 do you know, there's something, you, there's something riles up. A, is that right? All right, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about trying to be a Christian where God says something. He says, love your enemies and pray for them and do good to them. You really want him to do the proverbial lightning and just smack them because they touch God's anointing. Is that right? Man, we're going to have to get the worship team up here because uh, y'all were doing a lot better. I want to teach this believing for vindication, Deuteronomy 30. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, both the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you shall call to mind among the nations that the Lord your God has given you. Behold, I have set before you this day life and good, or death and evil, in that I command you this day to love your Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes, that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land where you are possessed. How many people know you have a lot more potential in your life? You're not finished yet. Is that right? Now, the enemy, based on what level of intensity you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness, is going to try to confront you, to dissuade you, disappoint you, frustrate you, and get your mind off of living in the spirit and get you smack into the flesh, into vain imaginations, and want, you just, just want. I, the, we were recently somewhere, and there was an elevator, and we were all dressed up at, the, at some event, and uh, I was, the door opened up, and it's very, very lovely. You could see they were multi-millionaires with the earrings and the diamonds and a jacket and all this kind of stuff. And the lady and the husband uh, got in smiling and all. They get in. And when the guy pressed the button, he backed up and she had open toe high heels and his heel mashed her on the big toe and she smacked the living helicopter out of him. Now, everybody knows and she should have known he didn't do that on purpose, but her reaction was, I mean, I, I mean, she, and I don't think she said, let's see, what am I going to do now? What should I do? What's the right thing to do? She just smacked the heck out of him right there in the elevator, okay, which caused him to be very embarrassed and, 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 and not punch her right in the face. You understand? 
Now I'm talking about, did you ever have someone just trigger that emotion and that razor tongue came right out of your mouth? Is that right? Yeah, I know, you're married. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, let me get back up here where it's safer here. All right, so he says, if you're going to possess the land, abundant life, you're going to have to understand there's giants in your future that wants to trip you up and cause you to get your mind off the gratefulness walking with the Lord because you're swimming in the sea of nasty flesh of other people. Is that right? Because how wonderful it would be if God would just take the wrong people out of your life. The people who do not understand the privilege of being in your life. All right, let me read it again a little bit further. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, do those choose life that both you and your generations will prosper in the potential of the Lord. You understand, it's not, it's not bad enough that we make bad decisions. We don't understand that that goes to the second and third and even fourth generation. On the other hand, we're walking in victory. We are sending blessings down because you represent exactly like David did on the battlefield against Goliath. You represent the nation, the nativity, the nations that haven't even been born yet. You understand that? Because God is a three-generational God. And so everything that you do right now is going to, f going to affect or prosper your generations. So God does that so you recognize you, must, you must walk with him because you are going to injure people that you love down the line, and you're going to be responsible for them because you are the blood on the doorpost for all of those individuals. Why is that? Because God wants us to feel responsible for the people we've been assigned to. Next week, I'm going to be, uh, I'm probably going to be teaching, uh, for example, like um, I have assigned Dan to me, he represents me in my ministry, but also, you know, there, there, there is a, a situation is everyone that you are assigned to or is assigned to you, you have to decide if you're going to trust them or not. The problem is I trust him, but everyone, everyone, what did I say? Everyone that you trust trust someone else, and that someone else that they trust is going to influence, influence the, the potential of the future here. I have had the nauseating problem of some, and even my leaders, the people that I trust to be responsible, fellowshipping with my enemies, taking them out to eat, on Facebook and so on with people that they know hurt me, my wife, my children, uh, my grandchildren, and our potential of our ministry. And they didn't value the trust that I put in them. And so they're friends with everybody. These are political people. They can't discern the fact that they're part of this body and that, see, it, I, I come out of the Sicilian, the the friend of my enemy is now my enemy. You understand that? If you can fellowship with someone who hurt this ministry because you're a Christian, you, you have forfeited the ability to be trust and your potential. And understand it's the devil that seduces people to do that. Now, this church, this ministry, Mike and Elaine are completely accessible at any time. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you think something's wrong with this ministry, you don't, you're not going to see an associate. You can talk to me anytime you want, and we'll talk about it. But don't believe the report of someone who is disloyal. But the Bible says not to do that because you're not destroying just 
one person's representative, you start destroying the potential of many, many thousands and even, even millions of people. Is that right? All right, but I want you to understand, God said, you got a choice when you woke up this morning. Are you going to walk in the blessing or are you going to walk in the, under a curse? Today is the day of salvation with plenty of grace to do right and walk with the Lord. Forgetting those things what happened yesterday and looking forward with, with, with a positive attitude of what's coming next. But right now, all day today, the blood has already been showed. Fresh blood, fresh grace today to walk in victory all day long. Today is the day of salvation. Why are you going to waste it with somebody that's, uh, that, that, that is negative? And so God said, heaven and earth will be your witnesses because the natural world reacts to someone that is in fellowship with God or someone who breaks fellowship with God. Everything in the nature will go wrong. That's why so many people are sick in the church. Now, it's not always the judgment of God, but I'm going to tell you, if you don't want peace to rule and reign in your heart, your anxiety will give you enough chemicals and hormone to destroy your body because your body will rebel against God's health because you don't want the peace of God. You don't want the joy of God. You, you walk in guilt and shame and condemnation and double mindedness. You're killing yourself. And it's your body that's warring against you. I studied medicine. Over 90 percent of all sicknesses are emotionally induced from your vain imaginations and your bitterness and your resentment or your fear or your dread or your hurt feelings or your disappointment. How can you, when in his presence is the fullness of joy, you don't have joy, you got the fat lip, you're pouting, you're mad, you're mad at the world, you're disappointed in God, you can't, you, 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 you well, okay. Okay, go on the internet and try to get some kind of funny pills to help you. Go right ahead. Yeah. So about the health of your countenance. Is that right? All right. So let's go a little bit further. This is a long message, and I'm going to stop just when I'm ready. Uh, and if you want to give me a clue when you get up and leave, I know that's about the end. All right. I will call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, though, though, that both you and your seed may live. You say again, what effect affects you? You ever go to the doctor's office for anything? And before they want to know anything about your symptoms, they ask about your mom and dad and your family. Did they have a heart attack? Did they have cancer or whatever? Because it's generational. So it's better for you not to get sick emotionally and spiritually, physically, because it's going to go down to your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. You don't, you, you, you know, you need to pay some responsibility here. So we must choose to believe that everything is working for our good. Why? Because Romans eight twenty eight says that. So if everything is working toward your good, Lord, how does the bad work for us? Well, if everything you did worked out, if everybody was nice and wonderful to you, and you never, ever had any trouble with anything, why would you need God? You have become God because you have ordered your world just the way you always wanted it. And you love everybody. Everything's okay. You got plenty of everything. God has to allow that because he knows most of us continue to live a life the way of, by what Adam did to us rather than live in our life how Jesus did for us. So most of us would rather resent, bitter, be embarrassed, angry, wish harm on other people, want to reject people, get them out of our life. And so when we, when we act like what Adam did to us, we forfeit what Jesus did for us. 
Why do so many people in the church have sleep disorders? When he gives sweet sleep to his beloved. Where's the contradiction? You can have a nice sleep and have health, or you can go through all the people that did you wrong and all your disappointment and all your first and all your hurt feelings and all your unforgiveness and all your resentment. And then your sleep is going to upset your mind, your, your, your physical body. Is that right? Why would God tell you take communion and tell you if you don't if you if, if you don't get rid of that attitude, this 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 wave is going to kill you. I didn't make that up. And he said, look, just look at the church. Many of them are dead already and the rest of them are sick because they want they want to honor me. But they don't they won't they won't honor me in their relationships. Did I make that up, Patty? Y'all went to Bible college. I didn't. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, I'm not going to get very far because I keep getting down there and preaching instead of just standing up here reading and teaching. Now, how many people know living under the blessing is a choice and inviting the cursing is also a choice? God says, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive. So you want to hold a grudge? Well, you're going to be judging yourself because as you judge your behavior, well, I'll let you. But if you judge another person and you want to cut that person off and you don't want to forgive them, well, you judge yourself. That's exactly how I'll handle it. And I'm just, so it's going to be just because that's what you would have done. So faith and trust are not the same thing. Faith is the great gift God gives us. Everybody has the same measure of faith, not more, not less. The difference is some of us learn to trust God more. Why? Because anytime you have faith for something and the devil attacks it, then we lose trust in God because it didn't happen rather than thinking that the devil crashed it, stole it, or we, it, it didn't happen so long enough. So we really are not trusting God because God said everything I do for you is good. I can't believe God let this happen to me after all I've done for him. I gave up the world. I, I paid my tithes. I, 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 this is what I get. Yeah, that's what you're going to get. Not just the hors d'oeuvres. You're going get, to get, get a little bit more coming. Because it's good for you to be afflicted, the Bible says. It's good for you to be afflicted. Why? So you can learn his statues. If you learn his statues and obey his commands, you'll have peace. You'll have joy. You can rule and reign in this present life like a, a, a divine. You can represent the kingdom of God and everything everybody's trying to get will come to you. Or you can rule and reign in your own life. Dead people don't rule and reign too well. So you got to reckon yourself as dead because you have to be dead to everything circumstantial and natural so you can be alive to everything that's supernatural. Even when it doesn't seem good, feel good, or make any natural sense, that is good or ever could be, we have to believe God is faithful, so this must be good. Is that right? God says, uh, you being sinful know how to give good gifts, good gifts to your children. He says, if your little boy asks you for bread and you hand him a stone, is that right? Now, what he's saying is, if you really trusted me, when something in life, I say it's bread, it's good, and you bite into it and you go, no, this is hard and not good. Well, you don't trust me because I said it was good. He says that if I hand you ask for a fish and I hand you a serpent and you go, this is not a fish, this is a, this is 
a poisonous snake. Well, then you don't trust me that I said it was a fish. And now that we enter into the kingdom through a gate called much trouble. In this life, he says, you will win the lottery every day. In this life, you will have much trouble. So we have trouble, and we want him to explain himself. He says, this is good for you because it trusts you. It teaches you to trust me for even more. But you want it your way, not my way, Brother Jose. Let's quote Romans 8.28 out loud. What? How many things? God said all things are good. What you so upset about and angry about and disappointed in God about? God said all things are good. You say, man, this, is, this ain't no fish. That thing is biting me. It's got fangs this long. It's rattling so on. How can this be breath breaking all my teeth out? Even when it doesn't seem good, feel good, or make any natural sense, that is good, or ever could be good. I believe God. I believe God. Trust and obey. Believe him and say, say, I believe, I believe God. Now, you might have to sing to yourself to get through some of the things. Everything in me doesn't see it's good, think it's good, feel it's good, smell it's good. But God said it's good because nothing can touch my life unless he allow it. Yeah, but I know that. Well, hey, wait a minute. You were bought with a price. You don't own you. Matter of fact, you were DOA when he met you. You were dead on arrival. You've been dead and you're not only dead because you, you smelled so bad with your flesh that he, when you died, it was double stink. He had to bury you in Jesus Christ. Your life is hid in Jesus Christ. You own nothing. You are not the Lord of your life. And God puts troublesome people in your life to let you know that you think you're in control of your life. I don't deserve this. Oh, here it comes. Oh, it's coming. More is going to come. Haven't you been through enough yet that seemed impossible to emotionally endure but eventually turned around to your good? You see, if you, if, you, if, if you have the right attitude, you can understand that trouble is the doorway to the banquet table. Because you go from level to level by obeying and agreeing with God. You don't rear with God, you stay on that level a long time. So I want you to look at somebody and say, please accept your Christian struggle. Jesus says, now look, I want you to believe in me. I believe in you. Okay, for the rest of your life, everybody in the world is going to hate you. But don't take it personally. It ain't about you. They're mad at me. Yeah, but it feels like they're mad at me. They're persecuting me. It feels like they're persecuting me. It ain't you they're talking about. He said, oh, yeah, it is. Your old nature is taking it personally because you want to be your own protector, your own savior, your own. Your, 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 yeah, you, 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 you just want life to be go your way. 
John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. You enter into the kingdom of God through much trouble. Trouble is always, doo -doo -doo -doo. you're about to be promoted if you pass the test. If not, you get a free, all-expense paid trip around the same mountain again. <laughs> but I have not leave you nor forsake you, so I'm going to give you another chance. But it might take quite a while for you to come back to the place where the... There's going to be a constant struggle between your old nature, what Adam did to you, and choosing to be what Jesus did for you. And there's traffic out there. There's unfair people. There's mean, nasty people. That, and the, and the, the worst of all people, those related to you, DNA. The Iranians and the Muslims are not our problem. Your family is your problem. Or those in the church family are your problem. Do you know I hardly get any criticism whatsoever from people that are outside this church? My family is being criticized and lied on and so on, and it's by the, the, the church family. Do you know the world does not split churches? Church people split churches. Your enemies will be those of your own family. But what did he say to do with those enemies? Love them. Bless them. Mortgage your house and send their kids to college. He said, if you want to be spiritually vindictive, love on them. And it's like setting their hair on fire. That's what the Bible says. You say, well, I, I want to hurt you. Well, bless them. See? You get to bless them, and they get to be upset that you're the one that blesses them. Is that right? That's the Bible, huh? All right, look at Galatians 5.17. The sinful carnal nature wants to do evil. We want to resent them. We want to criticize them. We want to judge them. We just, not just we're so Christian, we just don't want them to be nowhere around us. But to forgive people that have hurt you and your family really bad is not that easy for one reason, our emotional nature. The sinful natural nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature really desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not simply free to conduct your good intentions. So in other words, our good intentions is we want certain people out of our life. We want to avoid them because we don't want tr trouble. That, that we, we, we don't want to be, you know. But what we're really doing is God puts people in your life for you to trust, uh, uh, test you, how much are you going to believe that everything he allows in your life is good for you? Because we like to avoid trouble. Even if God said in this life we're going to have trouble, I don't know, he must have been talking to somebody else. Because I went to the intercessory prayer, I laid on my face there, I wrote it on a piece of paper, I put it in the aquarium, the intercessors are going to put their hands on it, so everything's going to be okay. Everything I don't want to happen to me is taken care of. <laughs> okay, 
There are always struggles and wars going on just in your own mind. There are always struggles and wars going on in our lives about what has authority. Will good or evil prevail on your life? Well, that's a perspective and a choice. And if you make a spiritual perspective that he is Lord, I commit my way to you, Lord. You said if I commit my way to your lordship, you will establish my thoughts and you will direct my steps. Why do you, why are my steps going towards that? God, you're not validating my goodness. You're not validating my trust in you. This is where he led them out of Egypt with the gross national product of wealth. And they take the gross natural and make a golden calf to worship him. That's the nature of men. We, we make idols out, out of even our own life, our own happiness, our own success. We want God to bless what we did. And we're not real crazy about what he wants to do with our life. There is a struggle between light and darkness. Paul said, that's what I want to do. This guy's writing the epistles for us to learn about God. And he says, you know what I want to do, I don't do. And, and, and what I don't want to do, I wind up doing. And, and man, I see this law in me. Yeah, that's what Adam did to us. But let's focus on what God, what Jesus did for us that we can walk in victory. So there is always a war between blessing and cursing. Now, God said, you know what he said, Chad? He said, I'm going to help you, Chad. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to break down your whole life into one day. When you woke up this morning, this was the day of salvation. I don't care how many times you said you were saved yesterday. Today is the day of salvation. Just today. Your reality is only, only right now. Matter of fact, it's only now. Faith is just now. Now it's now, now it's faith, now it's faith, it just keeps moving. So based on that mind, are you in the spirit or are you giving your mind to the natural? He says, but what I'm going to do, since you're going to keep going back to the natural, before you wake up, I'm going to sprinkle fresh blood from the throne that's going to cover from the time you wake up to the time you close your eyes today. So you're going to be walking in fresh blood so all your sin is going to be forgiven before you do it. And I'm going to give you grace that was not, not touched by human hands so that everything going wrong today, you'll be able to endure it. Don't look to tomorrow and don't remember yesterday. That's the Bible. I didn't invent that. We must realize that blessing is a choice and breaking the hedge is a choice. You want to be mad at her because she was gossiping about you? You want to do that? Well, break the hedge. The serpent will bite you. But the serpent biting you, that kind of stuff coming, is not to punish you, it's to correct you to give you a chance to make another choice through repentance. Don't tell me you don't have somebody in your life that it, it would be wonderful if they just disappeared. God, the Bible calls that murder. When you want somebody out of your life, they got put in your life just to, just to test you. Oh, you love me? You, 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 you want to please me? All right, well, love that person. Because I'm going to put that person in your life so that you have a choice. You can react to that person's flesh or same situation, you can respond to me. You know how wonderfully spiritually we are when nothing's going wrong?
sometimes you have people in your life who choose cursing. I have a word for them. It's not theological. I get to, I get to make up own names because I never went to Bible college, so I don't know any better. So, so when there are people in my life, I just assign them their self-cursed people because they rejected the blessing. And so their lives are tormented in many, many ways. They're, they're, they're frustrated, disappointed, depressed, got anxiety, sleep disorders. They're, they can't keep a job. They're addicted to something. They are angry at the world and so on. These are people that just decided they didn't need to get under the blessing. But the problem is they're in my life. Now, it's kind of good that they're in my life because I get to see what an example of someone who is self-cursed, and I'd rather be self-blessed. Behold, I put before you today a dozen. You can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose blessing or stay cursing. And he goes, you're such a dumb dumb. Choose life. It's in the Bible just exactly like that. God has to tip us off. Everything natural will act against them. They can't keep a job. They can't stay healthy. They can't stay off drugs. They can't stay off alcohol. They have to have medication and depression and worry and anxiety. They have to have all things. They got to be divorced. They got to be separated. They got to be, the court has to tell them what to do. And we all have somebody like that's real close to us. Proverbs 13, 15, good understanding brings favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. I've often asked God, why did you not put in the Bible a proverb? Why do you bite the hand that feeds you? We all know people that we did our best, we sacrificed, we did what we could, and they're not only ungrateful, they become your, they, they talk against you. And you make this solemn pledge, well, I'll never do that again. I ain't helping nobody no more. And never, let me tell you, I tried to help Sally. I did this. I helped her with her rent. And you know what she did? She went and told everybody all kinds of lies on me. Well, that's it. I ain't helping nobody else. You see, what Adam did to us is what we think to do. Bible says you do what seems right in your own eyes. It feels good to take and judge that thing. And seek to save our own life and our own reputation and our own happiness and what we, our own success. Well, go right ahead. But we, you know, we losing a lot of eternal reward. God gave authority to the physical elements, witness against those refusing the blessing and the cursing. You know, Korah wanted to be the leader of all the people, and he decided to do his own thing, and the ground just swallowed him up, and everybody who decided they wanted to be with him. Creation is under the, this is why when people are sick in the hospital and they call for me to go, I'll go pray for them, but I'm not going to tell anybody God's going to heal you because that ain't up to me. And whether, if, if, if they don't get, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to make them an expectation. Then I have no idea what God is dealing with, how he's dealing with them. I'm not going to interrupt that. We're going to lose our house. Well, you probably needed to. I bet you we could find some decisions you made along the way that God didn't want you to make. And now the, chick the chickens have come home. Very, very few of us have sudden destruction. It seems suddenly because the judgment came, but it took a long time getting here, and God gave an opportunity for a long time. Yeah. Nobody smokes one cigarette and gets lung cancer. And nobody got to be 400 pounds by eating one marshmallow. And nobody got deep in debt by charging something one time. 
Is that right? The prophet Ernie K. Doe, tainted the truth. Yeah, says the it the truth. Yeah. The struggle to believe for vindication. Here's the problem is when you have been criticized, lied on, embarrassed, re rejected, all those things, and you ask God to vindicate you. And he go, okay. I vindicate you. Yeah, but she's breathing. <laughs> she just went on a cruise. <laughs> How in the hell is that vindication, God? He said, do you trust me? Didn't I tell you it was bread? Are we going to trust God's word and be blessed? Or do we want to take control of our own world and only believe God when it looks like what it seems like in the way we want it to be? Lean not to your own understanding. Put no trust in your natural mind. You're dealing with Adam. You should be under the lordship of Jesus. I wrote there is a struggle between faith from God and your trust in God. That's the problem that we have. Sometimes he just doesn't move soon enough. He, he, and he wants to come and tell you when you, you stumble because this person is prospering and this person hurt your prosperity. They're they, they, they becoming somebody when they ruin your reputation and they're still out there. And then God says, wait a minute. I don't understand. He said, well, do you trust me? Yeah, I trust you. But it's easier to trust you if you do what I want you to do. Is that right? Okay. Well, let's go a little bit further. Uh, Matthew 5, 11 through 12. Uh, blessed are you. Blessed. Are, when are you blessed? You blessed when? When people <laughs> revile you. And that's a, it's a blessing because you get to identify with Jesus Christ. You wonder they can't recognize your goodness? They couldn't recognize Jesus Christ. I don't think they're going to recognize you. Bless. You want, you want the blessing? Here's the blessing. They'll revile you and they'll hate you as they hated him. And they'll persecute you. But uh, when all evil comes out against you, because you see, you're an enemy of darkness. And the only thing that's going to matter is that you're going to react to that circumstance or are you going to respond to God's word? Or are you going to react to that presence or are you going to respond to his presence? He calls you blessed. He calls you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but him calling you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and her calling you a thief, a, li a liar. So who's, wh whose reputation do you want to choose? It's not enough. See, the devil is always going to do the same thing. Adam and Eve, God's presence wasn't enough. To be blood washed, named in the Lamb Book of Life, the Holy Spirit invested in you, clothed in, right, right, in Jesus Christ, called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and that's not enough. You want everybody to like you and love you and recognize how wonderful you are. He 
his unconditional love just ain't enough. She don't like me. And you know, you know the hell of it? You don't know all the good I did for her. And then she goes and left, stabs me in the back. And he lets her. He who? Oh, the one that loves me unconditionally. <laughs> it ain't enough. I need counseling. <laughs> you need counseling from me? And you have the counselor in you? And, and Brother Mike has better words than the Holy Spirit? Thou art deluded. Because you're polluted with your own poison. There are scriptural verses we struggle to understand. Listen, if I, it's 1149. If I get you out of here by noon, is that all right? Don't resent me. Okay, I'm trying. Okay, there are scriptural verses we struggle to understand and struggle to accept if you are someone who reads the scriptures. Most church people pay a pastor to read the Bible for them and then tell them on Sunday what it says. Understand that? Thank God I'm reading the Bible. All right. Now, that's a thing called imprecatory psalms. I'm going to give you one. Psalm 510. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, God, for they have rebelled against you. And off with their heads. Stab them in the heart. Throw them to hell. In the book of Psalms, we find the so-called cursing psalms. That are precatory psalms. It's all kind of violence and malice and hate and hostility towards the enemies, especially our enemies, but also God's enemies if we have the time. <laughs> Psalm 58, 6. I love this one. Break their teeth, God. Smack them right in the mouth so hard, all their teeth fall out in Jesus' name. How about Psalm 69, 28? May they be blotted out of that book of life. I know you went in there. I got white out. Holy Ghost white out. Blot that name out. Don't let them. I don't want to go to heaven if they're going to be there. <laughs> Psalm 137, 8 and 9. Happy is the one who grabs their babies out of their arms and smashes his head up against that wall. This is the word of God. Psalm 109, 8 and 9 also says, may his days be few. How about kill him right now? May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. They should have never had that attitude towards me. These are not quotations of evil men. They were psalm writers inspired by God. How can this be? Well, I'll tell you what, almost Christ everybody in the world and a lot of Christians just don't believe in the wrath of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We have no idea when the wrath of God on the day of the Lord hits this place. It's going to be so valid, and the hearts of God's enemies will be so great. They will ask God to let the stones of the mountain fall on them rather than them bow the knee. But when the wrath of God hits this place, no one will understand. And when you stand before God, these verses are a group of called the imprecatory psalms. It comes from the word imprecate, which actually means curse. These imprecatory psalms are prayers asking God 
to curse the wicked who abuse God's people and defile his name. Now, let me go back. Behold, today I'll offer you a blessing or a curse. Now, these psalms are a, a look at the wrath of God towards evil where I killed my own son for you and it wasn't good enough. He didn't die dead enough. He didn't suffer long enough. He didn't bleed red enough for you. And when the wrath of the Father comes, it's, in, it's, it's unimaginable to us. So these Psalms and many variations call upon God to inflict terrible curses upon both God's and personal wicked enemies. Now, many people read these things and they think that David, who wrote at least five of them, maybe more, that David really, really hated his enemies. But what he's really was doing, revealing that God said, I will not strive with man forever. The grace period, the great dispensation, has a date where it ends. And when it ends, nothing will ever be the same. Making sense of the cursing psalms. First, People say, Pastor Mike, should we read them? Well, the Bible tells us to read the Bible, read the Word of God, and actually meditate on it day and night. Meditate on them day and night. But you don't get to pick and choose which ones. You have the whole counsel of the Word. You got the Old Testament in, in the suggestions, and then in the New Testament in the manifestations. You got the picture book. And then you got the real. And you need the balance of both those books. But if you're not meditating on the word of God, then you will not get a picture of how God really deals with man. Do you realize the Bible is only about God's relationship with man on earth? It ain't about anything else that God is involved with. And I want you to know God, God's involved with a lot more than earth. This is just for us to understand our relationship with God. That's all. 66 books. Second, weren't these spoken in the Old Testament where God was always mad at everybody? In the New Testament where now he falls in love with them and he repents for what he did? Nay, nay, the whole Old, New, the Old Testament is about the love of the Father. Third, isn't the Old Testament about justice and wrath and the New Testament is all about forgiveness and love? No, the truth is the sincere love is the very heart of God in the Old Testament. He gave him the picture in the wilderness by lifting up the serpent that all, everything could be healed in man if they keep their eye on Christ. Fourth, these words may be emotional exaggerations and just getting caught up and carried away while not really meaning any harm. No, the writers inspired by God were representing God in just a glimpse out of one eye of the character of God. We focus, of course, on Jesus. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, keep my commandments, and then to keep each one, you develop a character of Christ so you're less like you and more like Jesus Christ. But the whole Bible, old and new, is all about God's unconditional love. But you see, we love everybody and put up with everybody under our conditions. And when they don't fit our conditions, we, don't have, we, don't, we move from them. We don't need them. We don't want them. If you're going to be a fellow of me, read this, sign it. You promise that, that you're going to, you're going to you, you know, or, or you won't have me. 
and I'll feel justified because you disappointed me and you did not realize all of my prerequisites. So it's your fault to be out of my life. All psalms are written. You think I've been around long enough? I'll tell you what. All psalms are written in intense emotion, and, and it's all for our instruction and encouragement to show us when you feel anger, resentment, disappointing, and you want them out of your life, you understand that's an emotional feeling that you got from Adam. And God wants you to imitate his love, which is unconditional and accepting. And God will move them in and out of your life according to his will, not your will. And when you move somebody out of your life, you have murdered them. The biblical description of murder is not shooting somebody with a gun. It's removing someone from your life that God put in your life to crucify your flesh. You don't have to forgive if you have no one in your life. That's why he invented marriage. <laughs> is that right? That's why shacking up and hooking up and so on is illegal to God, because God created inside a man a brain that's a male brain that is stronger and more potent in one area. And a woman's brain, it's less. But in a woman's brain, there are areas that are more potent and, and, and more impassioned than others. So that to get an agreement, at least one of us has to die. <laughs> is that right? We're about to go to lunch. Honey, you, 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 where you want to go? And the husband, because he's been married, anywhere you want to go is okay. <laughs> it's all right with me. I, I, I have no, no. And the wife said, no, no, where you want to go? Well, I'd like to go. I'd, I'd like to go get a hamburger. Okay. And then the whole time she's eating that hamburger. <laughs> See? Because she said to keep the peace. Wherever you want to go, it's okay with me until you do. <laughs> now, nobody knows about that. All right, last thing I'm going to do. I, I, we could go on for it. Discern positional righteousness. In other words, you have to believe you are sitting here in front of Mike on 3600 Manhattan, Alabama, on this pew. But that's a, just a natural truth. The truth is you're seated in heavenly places more than a conqueror. You already, you already, you already have positional righteousness. Your position in the spirit is in heavenly places. Your caucus is sitting here. Now, you can agree with your person sitting in heavenly places, or you can resent and get bitter and, you know, in, 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 in this thing that's got to die. A stand, please.